step into a realm where the line between reality and horror blurs, as we present to you a bone-chilling exploration of some of the most shocking crimes ever committed. Our new video peels back the layers of these disturbing incidents, inviting you to witness the eerie details, elusive suspects, and the relentless pursuit of justice. From unsolved enigmas that continue to confound experts to the spine-tingling tales of true crime, prepare to embark on a journey that will grip your imagination and send shivers down your spine. 1. Julie Ward Julie Ward was in Kenya when she was murdered in September 1988 and her partial remains discovered by her father. Her body had been dismembered and burnt. Julie was reported missing by her father John after Dixon called to say that Julie had never arrived back to Nairobi and John flew to Kenya to try and find her. He hired a plane to search the places that he knew she would camp and her jeep was spotted close to a river with an SOS message in dirt on top of the vehicle. John investigated the site and found a burnt out fire and footsteps leading away from the scene. Her partial remains including her leg, jawbone and a lock of hair along with some personal items including her flip-flops, sunglasses and a half-eaten tin of sardines were found 10 kilometers from her jeep. A month later, Further remains including her skull and upper jawbone were found near the Kenya-Tanzania border. Julie was originally from Barry Street Edmonds in England and was in Africa photographing wildlife, staying with an ex-Pat Paul Well Dixon in Nairobi. Julie was traveling with a friend Glenn Burns when her vehicle broke down after going to lunch at Serena Sopa Lodge. They were towed back to the lodge and Julie stayed there until her car was fixed by a local mechanic. Glenn returned to Nairobi. After her vehicle was fixed Julie left to drive back to her camp to collect camping equipment on September 6, 1988. This was the last time she was seen alive before the Mori Safari death. The authorities in Kenya put forward a number of bizarre theories including that she had been struck by lightning and eaten by lions or hyenas. Other theories are that she had committed suicide, killed due to an affair with a politician or that she had stumbled across a drug or weapon smuggling operation. The investigation was handled poorly by Kenyan authorities. The initial report by the coroner had been changed by a second doctor to cover up that she had been dismembered with a sharp blade. Instead the report was altered to conclude that she had been eaten by wild animals and this was announced at a press conference by the police. John has made a number of visits to Kenya over the years and has spent over one million pounds on the investigation. Her father John believed that the government had covered up the murder in order to protect the tourist industry. The head gamekeeper of the park was also suspended from his role after the crime was discovered. In 1990, John Ward asked the Foreign Secretary to intervene and Scotland Yard investigated the murder. As a result of the discovery of strands of hair at the Macari Rangers outpost camp in 1992, two park rangers were arrested. A 1997 investigation by Kenyan police led to the arrest of the head gamekeeper at the reserve as it had concluded that Julie could not have driven her jeep to the location that it was discovered at. In 2008, advances in DNA technology led to the discovery of DNA of one of the attackers from the crime scene and in 2011 a number of DNA samples were collected to be tested. The Metropolitan Police reopened the case in 2009 after a visit to Kenya. The investigation however didn't create any new leads despite a new witness claiming to know the whereabouts of the crime scene and potentially more of Julie's remains. In October 1989, a Kenyan inquest ruled that the crime was in fact a murder by an unknown person or persons but failed to pass the case to the Attorney General for investigation. An inquest in 2004 ruled a verdict of unlawful killing after it was discovered that her body was dismembered with a machete. Dirt from the scene revealed that the remains and likely her personal items had been covered in petrol before being set alight. It also concluded there were a number of inconsistencies and lies from those involved in the original inquest. Valentine Uhuru Kadipo claimed to have witnessed the killing. He told authorities that Ward was tortured and bludgeoned to death on orders of the ruling Kenya African National Union due to her involvement with Jonathan Waugh. Valentine fled the country for fear of the death squads after giving his statement. John Ward believed that Julie was romantically involved with Jonathan Waugh, the son of then-President Waugh and that he had sexually assaulted and murdered her. Waugh died in April 2019 due to pancreatic cancer. 
Three park rangers and another member of staff were considered suspects as the result of vaporous investigations, but all were later acquitted. Simon Olmakala, the head gamekeeper, became the lead suspect due to his inconsistent statements to police. He lied about his whereabouts at the time of the murder and told police he was unable to drive despite evidence of a car crash he was involved in and witness statements. Thirteen more suspects have been interviewed but no arrests have been made. In 1992, two park rangers Jonah Tishum Majroy and Peter Mechui Kapin were tried and acquitted of the murder of Julie Ward due to a lack of evidence and released from custody after spending 22 months in jail. The judge ruled that the hair and camera battery found in their camp was insufficient evidence. David Kandula Olin Choko, a staff member at the game reserve was discharged by a committal court for lack of evidence. The judge in the case suggested to look at the head gamekeeper Simon Olmakala due to the statement he gave during the trial of the two park rangers and the 1997 investigation concluded the same. In 1999, the head gamekeeper Simon Olmakala was tried and acquitted of her murder due to lack of evidence. Both the assessors in the case and the judge agreed that there was insufficient evidence. This is where our story about Julie Ward ends. Leave us your opinion in the comments about this story. Let's continue the rest of the stories. 2. Sylvia Likens Gertrude Banasuski aka The Torture Mother was convicted of first-degree murder for the killing of 16-year-old Sylvia Likens, who died on October 26, 1965. Sylvia's father Lester Likens worked at Carnival selling candy and drinks and would take his sons with him but didn't want to take his daughters. Sylvia's mother Elizabeth Likens was put in county jail on July 3, 1965 for shoplifting. Sylvia and Jenny Likens had met Gertrude Banasuski's children Paula and Stephanie at Arsenal Technical High School in 1965. After hearing of their mother's arrest Paula invited the sisters to stay the night. Lester returned to town and found out about his wife's incarceration and Betsy agreed she would join Lester upon her release. He agreed to send Sylvia and Jenny to live with Gertrude at 3850 East New York Street because their daughters were friends from high school. For his daughter's board Lester promised to pay them $20 a week for their care and costs. Gertrude accused Sylvia of stealing from her and burned the girl's fingertips. She took her to a church function and force-fed her free hot dogs until she was sick. Then, as punishment for throwing up good food, she forced her to eat her own vomit. She allowed her children, in fact, encouraged her children to partake in the abuse of Sylvia and her sister. The Banasuski kids practiced karate on Sylvia, slammed her into walls and onto the floor. They used her skin as an ashtray, threw her downstairs, and cut open her skin and rubbed salt into her wounds. After this, she would often be cleansed in a scalding hot bath. Gertrude gave sermons on the evils of sexual immortality while Paula stomped on Sylvia's vagina. Paula, who herself was pregnant, accused Sylvia of being with child and mutilated the girl's genitals. Gertrude's 12-year-old son John Jr. delighted in forcing the girl to lick his youngest sibling's soiled diapers clean. Sylvia was forced to strip naked and shove an empty Coca-Cola bottle into her vagina while the Banasuski children watched. Sylvia was so beaten that she was unable to use the bathroom voluntarily. When she wet her mattress, Gertrude decided that the girl was no longer fit to live with the rest of her children. The 16-year-old was then locked in the basement without food or access to the bathroom. Gertrude spread every story she could imagine to get the local kids to join in on the beatings. She told her daughter that Sylvia had called her a whore and got her daughter's friends to come over and beat her up for it. Sylvia Likens died after attempting to escape from the basement of Gertrude Banasuski's home. Earlier in the day she had heard Gertrude saying that she was arranging to leave her to die in the middle of a forest. Gertrude stamped on her head as she collapsed as she attempted to leave. She was carried to a bathtub so Stephanie could bathe her but she noticed she was not breathing. Stephanie attempted CPR but they were unable to revive her and Gertrude shook her to wake her up but she was dead. They moved her body to a mattress and rehearsed what they would tell the police as they knew they would have to report her death to authorities. Hours after Sylvia's death Gertrude ordered Richard to call the police from a local payphone. She told them that Sylvia had recently run away and had reappeared wounded, clutching a note. 
Gertrude pretended to be sad and told officers that she was giving first aid to Sylvia when she died. The officers entered the room to find the malnourished form of Sylvia lying lifeless on the stained mattress. Gertrude told the police that she had been attacked by a gang of boys and showed them the note she had forced her to write. The police asked Jenny what had happened and initially she told the police what Gertrude had told her to say. She managed to whisper to one of the policemen that if he got her out of there she would tell them everything. Gertrude Banasuski was arrested after Jenny gave a statement admitting that she had lied at the house. She told the authorities that Gertrude had been abusing Sylvia. Jenny also said named Paula, Stephanie, and John Banasuski Jr. as being responsible for the abuse of Sylvia and they were arrested. Coy Hubbard and Richard Hobbs were arrested later that day. Charges were dropped against Anna Ruth Sisko, Judy Darlene Duke, Michael John Monroe, Darlene McGuire, and Randy Gordon Lepper, who were also initially arrested. There were a number of children who were too young to be arrested or charged. The autopsy was performed by Dr. Arthur Keppel. Her cause of death was listed as subdural hematoma due to her receiving a severe blow to her right temple. Shock due to her wounds and swelling of the brain were also contributing factors. Sylvia had more than 150 injuries and wounds on her body. They included burns, bruising and damage to nerves and muscles. Her fingernails were bent backwards and her skin was peeling. Many of the wounds were in various stages of recovery, showing ongoing trauma for weeks prior to her death. Gertrude Banasuski, her children Paula and John, Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard were tried together in a trial that spanned 17 days. Stephanie was due to be given a separate trial, but she made a deal to become a state witness. This was due to the collective nature of the crime, as they all committed the abuse together. All were found guilty due to the testimony of Deputy Coroner Charles Ellis, Stephanie Banasuski, and Jenny Likens. A number of other witnesses also testified about the abuse to Sylvia, but Gertrude would justify the abuse. The defense team argued that Gertrude was insane and did not know what she was doing. Gertrude Banasuski testified in her own defense and claimed that her children and others had been abusing Sylvia. She claimed to have not noticed this abuse as she was in ill health and suffering from depression. She admitted to spanking the girls once but found it too emotional and did not hit them again. Richard Hobbs testified that he had been encouraged to inflict minor wounds on Sylvia after Gertrude had already done so. He also told the court that Gertrude had told him that she was going to get rid of Sylvia. Marie Banasuski admitted she had assisted Hobbs on one occasion and that her mother showed no emotion after abusing Sylvia. She pointed the finger at her mother and sister as being the main culprits and also implicated other neighborhood children. Witnesses against Paula Banasuski testified that she would brag about the abuse of Sylvia, including when she beat her so hard she broke her own wrist. Gertrude Banasuski was found guilty of first-degree murder sentenced to life in prison. Gertrude's daughter Paula Banasuski was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Banasuski Jr. were found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to the reformatory for 2 to 21 years. Upon appeal the convictions of Gertrude and Paula were reversed by the Indiana Supreme Court in September 1970. They found that requests for a change of venue and separate trials for the defendants had impeded the chance of them receiving a fair trial. Gertrude Banasuski was again found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 18 to life. Paula Banasuski struck a plea bargain prior to the new trial and agreed to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter. Gertrude Banasuski was paroled in 1985 to a national outcry. She never took responsibility for her acts and said she had no memory of the crime. Gertrude moved to Iowa, where she lived until her death. Paula Banasuski was released on parole in 1972 and changed her name to Paula Pace. She lived under this identity until it was revealed in 2012 and she was fired from her position as a school counselor. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Banasuski Jr. were all released on parole on February 27, 1968, after serving less than two years in the Indiana Reformatory. Hobbs died just four years later at the age of 21 from lung cancer. Gertrude Banasuski died on the June 16, 1990. She died from lung cancer.
This is where our story about Sylvia Likens ends. Leave us your opinion in the comments about this story. Let's move on to the last story. 3. Jody Arias Jody Arias was convicted of first-degree murder for the killing of Travis Alexander on June 4, 2008. He was stabbed more than 20 times, had been shot in the head and had his throat cut. Jody met Travis Alexander at a conference in Las Vegas in 2006. He was a Mormon and Jody converted to the faith when they began a relationship in January 2007. Their five-month relationship was long distance but they would often travel between California and Arizona to be together. Jody was said to be obsessed with him. Travis Alexander's family and friends told police this during the initial interviews. They told the police that Jody had hung around the property and had entered his home without his permission. They believed that she had slashed his tires, logged into his Facebook account and followed him on dates. Travis Alexander was violently murdered on June 4, 2008. He had been stabbed close to 30 times, his throat had been cut and he had been shot in the head. The autopsy of Travis Alexander revealed defensive wounds on his hands but the coroner believed that Travis had died before he was shot. His friends were worried because Travis had not been seen for five days and had missed an important business phone call on the evening of June 4. The Travis Alexander crime scene photos reveal a bloody crime scene. They found blood in the hallway, entered his room and found Travis Alexander's body in the shower. His friends immediately suspected Jody of his murder. A week before the murder, there was a burglary at Jody's grandparents and a pistol was stolen that was never found. This was significant as a bullet casing from the same type of gun was found at the crime scene. Jody met a lover the day after the murder who was surprised that she had dyed her hair and she had bandaged cuts on her hands. Her bloody handprint was discovered on a wall in the hallway of Travis Alexander's house. Police also found a digital camera in the washing machine which contained a number of Jody Arias photos found in the camera, taken on the day of them both in sexual poses. There was a photograph that appears to show the murder. Jody was arrested for first-degree murder at her home on July 5, 2008 and extradited to Arizona. She initially told investigators both she and Travis were attacked by intruders. Her next account was that she was innocent as she had an alibi. It wasn't until two years later that Jody Arias' story changed to killing Travis in self-defense. A jury was selected in December 2012 and Jody Arias' trial began on January 2, 2013. The prosecution argued cold-blooded murder and the defense argued that it was self-defense. During the Jody argued that the cuts to her hands were from working in a bar that was found to not exist. The prosecution argued that the gun use was from a staged robbery at her grandparents' house to obtain the gun as she had planned the killing. Jody spent a total of 18 days on the stand testifying in her own defense. She spoke of childhood sexual abuse and about her sex life with Travis. She alleged that he had forced her to carry out perverted sexual acts. Jody testified that the relationship became violent both physically and emotionally. She made claims of violent physical and verbal assaults and claimed she had killed him in self-defense. She claims that she defended herself when he became violent after she accidentally dropped his camera. This was the third different account that she had given on Travis Alexander's death. Both sides argued for and against Jody suffering from PTSD and amnesia. They also argued for and against whether the crime was premeditated, with a purchase gas can be the vital evidence to prove this. The prosecution argued that she filled a gas can to avoid having to fill her car and be caught on CCTV as she traveled to Travis. On May 7, 2013, after 15 hours of jury deliberation in the Arias trial, she was found guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. The sentencing began on May 15, 2013 with the aggravation phase of sentencing. The prosecution sought the death penalty for Jody Arias due to the violent nature of the Travis Alexander crime scene and the jury decided she was eligible to be sentenced to death. During the penalty phase in May 2013, Travis' family gave statements and Jody pleaded for a life sentence. The jury failed to reach a decision with 8 for versus 4 against and this led to a mistrial. 
The sentencing retrial began in October 2014 and resumed in January 2015 after a break. This once again ended in a mistrial with a hung jury. They were unable to come to an unanimous decision with 11 in favor and one against the death penalty. The decision on sentencing fell to the judge, with the choice of life without parole or with parole after 25 years. Jody Arias' sentence was decided as life without the possibility of parole. During Jody's trials her lawyers filed for mistrial on numerous occasions. They argued perjury of key witnesses, inappropriate behavior of prosecutors and claims defense witnesses were harassed. Juan Martinez was accused of leaking details of the Jody Arias case to a blogger and he was placed on administrative leave in February 2020. An appeal was made to the Arizona Supreme Court who declined to hear the appeal. The Arizona Court of Appeals also declined to hear the case. The 15-year-old's case was being forgotten, so Andy Van Denher gambled his own freedom to find her killer. When 15-year-old Nicole Van Denher was murdered in the Netherlands in 1995, her family hoped police would act quickly to find the culprit and bring them to justice. However, as the years went by and leads dried up, they began to fear the schoolgirl's memory was fading and the killer would never be caught. But Nicole's stepbrother Andy knew new technology could help investigators solve the murder mystery and he had one heck of a risky plan to prove it. This is the remarkable story of how a brother's enduring loyalty put a dangerous criminal behind bars. It was October 6, 1995, and Nicole Van Denherk had stayed the night at her grandmother's before cycling to work at a nearby shopping center. Perhaps she was a little on edge that morning, as she had complained to her aunt just a day earlier that an unnamed man had harassed her on her way home. Nevertheless, the teenager dutifully set off to her job, but she never arrived. The police were swiftly called, and Nicole's bicycle was located discarded by a river that evening. There was still no trace of Nicole herself, and an intensive search began to locate the youngster. It wasn't until November 22, 1995 that a walker made a tragic discovery in the woods between Mirlo and Lirop, Nicole's body. She had been raped, and an autopsy concluded she had suffered a fractured jaw, injuries to her head and fingers, and a stab wound from a small knife that had likely been fatal. The Dutch authorities struggled to find any leads, and they arrested Nicole's stepfather and stepbrother Andy Van Den Herk in the summer of 1996. However, the move seems to have been an act of desperation, as they were quickly cleared of any wrongdoing and swiftly released. To add insult to injury, the number of detectives working Nicole's case was cut and, apart from a brief review in 2004, slowly went cold. By 2011, Andy had moved to England to start a new life, but he remained tormented by his beloved sister's killer getting away with murder. What's more, he must have known that had newly emerging DNA techniques been available back in 1995, the perpetrator would likely already be behind bars. So, Andy hatched a plan to jolt the investigation back to life. Nicole had been buried in the Netherlands not long after her murder, and he knew that in the absence of any new evidence, she would remain in the cemetery as would any precious DNA material buried with her. The caring stepbrother therefore created a new lead by handing himself into Stevenage Police on March 8, 2011 and getting himself rearrested. In a post on his Facebook page, he said, I will be arrested today at, sick, the murder of my sister. I confessed. We'll get in contact soon. Investigators were dumbfounded and Dutch police began extradition proceedings, unsure whether Andy was responsible or not. Upon his return to the Netherlands, it quickly became clear that Andy remained innocent and he was once again released. But the plan worked, the authorities agreed to reopen the case and see what DNA evidence remained with Nicole's body. When asked why he falsely confessed, Andy commented, I wanted to get her exhumed and get DNA off her. I kind of set myself up and it could have gone horribly wrong. To get her exhumed I had to put steps in place, and said I did it. She is my sister. I miss her every day. Nicole's remains were examined for genetic material and, incredibly, scientists in New Zealand were able to use pioneering techniques to discover DNA belonging to three different men. The first was Nicole's boyfriend, who was never a suspect. 
The second was from an unknown profile, and the third was from a convicted rapist named as Josta G. Suspects are not identified by their full names in the Netherlands. The 46-year-old had by this time been convicted for rape three times, with one in 2001 resulting in compulsory psychiatric treatment. That case was startlingly similar to Nicole's. The young woman had been grabbed from her bicycle, taken to a remote area and sexually assaulted. The only difference was that he didn't kill her. Tichy's psychological evaluation from the time was quoted by NL Times as saying that he was a vessel overflowing with hate who could offend again if not adequately addressed. What was more, the suspect was known to have fought with his ex-girlfriend on the day Nicole disappeared, storming from her home just a few hours before the abduction. Dutch police arrested and charged Tichy with rape and murder, but the fight for justice still wasn't over. On November 21, 2016, he was sensationally acquitted of murder and found guilty only of rape. The sentence was just five years in prison. Although the jury had been unanimous in agreeing to Chi rape Nicole and did not believe his version of events, he claimed he might have had consensual sex with her, but he couldn't remember the unknown DNA was a sticking point. They said they had been forced to consider the possibility that there was another person involved in the murder and, as such, could not convict a G as culpable. Nicole's stepmother Jolanda van der Weyden, who had been hoping alongside the prosecution for a 14-year sentence, sobbed in court and shouted, What if this would happen to your children? This is simply unbelievable. An appeal was mounted, and at last, prosecutors were able to convince the court that G raped Nicole and murdered her to prevent her from telling the police what had happened. Crucially, no importance was placed upon the unidentified third sample of DNA, which, it was argued, could have come from anywhere. Josta G was sentenced in 2018 to 12 years imprisonment for the rape and manslaughter of Nicole van den Herk, more than 20 years after her brutal death. Tragically, despite his bravery in getting Nicole's case reopened and finally solved, it was reported in 2021 that her stepbrother Andy had taken his own life at his home in England. His Facebook legacy page would seem to support this, with his final post on August 25, 2021 alluding to his impending suicide and stating, I'm ready to say goodbye. This remarkable and poignant case truly demonstrates the cost of murder and injustice that can be wrought on those left behind, even after the killer is behind bars. Here our first story ends. Before moving on to the other story. Leave us your opinion in the comments. Dorothy Scott followed the same routine every day. The 32-year-old single mother would load her four-year-old son into her car and drive to her parents' home in Anaheim, California. She would leave her son with her parents while she went to work as a secretary for the owner of two gift shops in Anaheim. When she finished work each evening, she would return to her parents' house, pick up her son, and make the short drive to her home in Stanton, California. She lived a very predictable life, rarely deviating from her set routine. Dorothy was a devout Christian who rarely went out after work. She preferred to stay at home with her son, who was the center of her world. Her son's father, Dennis Terry, lived in Fairgrove, Missouri. He and Dorothy had a cordial relationship and he would occasionally travel to California to visit his son. In 1980, Dorothy started receiving strange phone calls while she was at work from an unidentified man. The man claimed that he was in love with Dorothy but his calls were anything but friendly. He told Dorothy that he was always watching her and he intended to kill her. Dorothy was so frightened by the man's threats that she started taking karate so she would be better able to protect herself. Dorothy told her parents, Jacob and Vera Scott, about the threats and how worried they made her. According to Vera, one phone call particularly bothered her. One day he called and said to go outside because he had something for her. She went out and there was a single dead rose on the windshield of her car. In May 1980, Dorothy received another phone call that really disturbed her. The man told her, you are going to come my way and when I get you alone, I will cut you up into bits so no one will ever find you. Dorothy hung up on the unidentified caller, but his message left her feeling shaken. Dorothy had no idea how she had attracted her anonymous admirer. She rarely dated and never socialized with people she didn't know. Her father noted, we just can't put that together. She worked from morning to evening, she might have an occasional date, 
but they were few and far between. On the evening of May 27, 1980, Dorothy had to stay at work later than usual because her boss had scheduled a meeting with all of his employees. While she was at the meeting, Dorothy noticed that Conrad Bostrin, one of her co-workers, appeared to be in distress. He had been bitten by a spider earlier that day, and his arm was red and swollen. Dorothy's maternal instincts took over, and she insisted that Conrad needed to go to the hospital to have his arm looked at by a doctor. Conrad was reluctant to go to the hospital, but Dorothy and another co-worker, Pam Head, were eventually able to convince him that he needed to be seen. Dorothy told him she would drive him to the hospital, and Pam decided to go to keep Dorothy company while she waited for Conrad to be treated. The three co-workers left the employee meeting and headed for UCI Medical Center in the neighboring town of Orange, making a quick stop at Dorothy's parents' house so she could check on her son. Dorothy exchanged the black scarf she had been wearing for a red scarf, kissed her son goodbye, and told her parents she would be back in a few hours. At the hospital, Pam and Dorothy read magazines and watched television while they waited for Conrad's arm to be treated. It was after midnight by the time he was seen by a doctor who prescribed medication to help his arm heal. Pam went with Conrad to get his prescription filled by the hospital's pharmacist while Dorothy went outside to the parking lot to get her car. She told her co-workers she would pick them up at the entrance to the hospital. Pam and Conrad finished their business at the pharmacy and headed for the hospital lobby. They had expected to find Dorothy waiting for them when they went outside, but there was no sign of her. They waited for several minutes, then decided to start walking to the parking lot where Dorothy had parked earlier that evening. As the co-workers were heading for the parking lot, they saw Dorothy's car heading toward them, but it didn't slow down. Instead, it raced past them and pulled out of the hospital parking lot. Pam was confused. We waved our hands. There was no way she could have missed us. The car made her right. We started running after it, but it sped up. Conrad and Pam returned to the entrance of the hospital and waited there for a few minutes, expecting to see Dorothy's car turn around and head back for them. It never did. After waiting for more than an hour, they waved down one of the hospital's security guards, but he said there was little he could do. Eventually, the co-workers found another ride home. Although Pam and Conrad had been confused by Dorothy's abrupt departure, they weren't initially worried about her. They thought she might have had some kind of emergency at home, perhaps with her son, and had needed to leave immediately. They assumed they would see her at work later that day and would be able to ask her what had happened. They would never get the chance. Around 4.30 a.m., Dorothy's car was found, abandoned and in flames, in an alley in Santa Ana, California, about 10 miles away from the UCI Medical Center. There was no sign of Dorothy. After Dorothy's parents spoke to Conrad and Pam and learned about what had transpired at the hospital, they reported their daughter missing. They feared that the man who had harassed Dorothy with phone calls while she was working had finally made good on his threats to kill her. Investigators had no idea what might have happened to Dorothy, but they thought it was possible that she had been carjacked or abducted from the hospital parking lot. Neither Pam nor Conrad had been able to tell who was driving Dorothy's car as it sped away from the hospital the car's bright headlights had prevented them from being able to see inside. Detectives theorized that Dorothy might have been ambushed as she walked through the darkened parking lot to get to her car, it was very possible that she hadn't been the person behind the wheel when Pam and Conrad tried to flag the car down. Wondering if they had a kidnapping on their hands, investigators asked the family to refrain from discussing the case with anyone in the days following Dorothy's disappearance. They hoped that Dorothy's abductor would contact either police or the family with some kind of ransom demand, and they feared that the kidnapper would be too afraid to do so if the case received a lot of publicity in the local newspapers. The following week, Jacob and Vera received a phone call from an unidentified man who asked them if they were related to Dorothy Scott. Vera told the caller that she was Dorothy's mother, and the man exclaimed, I've got her. Before Vera could any questions, the man hung up. He didn't call back, and it was unclear if he truly had abducted Dorothy or if his phone call was simply a cruel prank. Two weeks after Dorothy was last seen, her parents were growing increasingly worried about her safety. 
Although they had initially agreed with investigators that the case should be kept out of the newspapers, there had been no more calls from Dorothy's presumed abductor and Jacob decided it was time to let the public know about his daughter's disappearance. On June 11, 1980, he called the editor of the Santa Ana Orange County Register and told him about what had happened to Dorothy. He admitted that police had asked him not to go to the press, but he felt he had no other choice. The light at the end of the tunnel seems to be getting dim. The newspaper ran a story about Dorothy's disappearance on June 12, 1980. That night, a man called the newspaper's office and claimed that he was the person who abducted Dorothy. Managing editor Pat Riley took the phone call, and he later told investigators that the man had sounded as if he were telling the truth. After a lot of years, you get a feeling about people. He did sound genuine. The unidentified caller told Pat that he loved Dorothy, but he had to kill her. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. As if to assure Pat that he was telling the truth, the caller provided details that hadn't been made available to the general public. He knew that Dorothy had taken a co-worker to the hospital to get a spider bite treated, and he accurately described the clothing she had been wearing when she vanished. The caller claimed that Dorothy had called him from the hospital to let him know she was there. He said he went there to confront her with evidence that she was cheating on him, she denied it, but he claimed he had photographic evidence. He insisted that he had no other choice but to kill her, though he refused to provide any further details, such as how he had killed her or where her body could be found. Pam told investigators that she had been with Dorothy in the hospital waiting room the entire night, and she was certain that Dorothy hadn't made any phone calls. This meant that at least part of the unidentified caller's story couldn't be true, but he had provided enough details that those close to Dorothy feared he really had killed her. Jacob and Vera tried to remain optimistic. They told Dorothy's son that his mother had to go away for a while to help take care of a sick friend, but as days turned into weeks, the little boy seemed to sense that something was wrong. Finally, he confronted his grandparents. Don't tell me no more stories. I want to know, even if it's bad news. Farah told reporters that the little boy was doing his best to remain strong but seemed to know that he wasn't going to see his mother anymore. He seems to understand what is happening. He says he hopes whoever has his mommy will send her home so he can give her to Jesus. Detectives interviewed everyone associated with Dorothy but were unable to come up with any viable suspects in her disappearance. She had no known boyfriends, and her son's father was confirmed to be in Missouri when she vanished. Police Chief Michael Michelle admitted to reporters that the situation was grim. The Scots are probably reaching the point that we have reached that we probably won't find her alive. There is always a glimmer of hope, but it isn't very bright. In July 1980, Jacob and Vera announced that they were offering a $2,500 reward for information leading to the whereabouts of their daughter or to the arrest of the person responsible for her disappearance. Investigators received a few tips after this announcement but were unable to develop any substantial leads. Dorothy's case soon faded from the headlines, but her parents were plagued by a series of phone calls from the man they believed to be their daughter's killer. The unidentified man would ask if Dorothy was home, then gleefully admit that he had taken her and killed her. According to Jacob, most calls came in the afternoon when my wife was home. It was a soft-spoken voice, and they didn't stay on very long. The torturous calls continued for four years. Finally, in May 1984, the man called while Jacob was home. It was clear the unidentified caller hadn't expected a male to answer the phone, up until this point, he had only spoken to Vera and seemed to relish tormenting her. After speaking briefly with Jacob, the man hung up. Investigators theorized that the man didn't recognize that Jacob was Dorothy's father and may have believed that the family had moved away, the man didn't call them again. On August 6, 1984, a subcontractor for Pacific Bell was digging a trench on Santa Ana Canyon Road when he discovered human skeletal remains. He immediately called the police and investigators carefully excavated the area. Along with human bones, they found a woman's watch and a distinctive turquoise ring. It didn't take long for them to confirm that Dorothy Scott had finally been found. 
Jacob admitted that the discovery of his daughter's body had come as a surprise, but he was glad the wait for our answers was finally over. It's a big relief. It's one hell of a relief. He had spent four years imagining the worst, at least he no longer had to wonder if she was being tortured or held hostage somewhere. Jacob and Vera had been awarded custody of their grandson, who was understandably upset when he learned his mother was dead. He understands more now than he did then, so it's more emotional for him now. Jacob told reporters that he and Vera would do everything possible to make sure he had access to everything he needed. He's got our shoulders to lean on. After local newspapers reported that Dorothy's body had been found, the unidentified caller began calling Vera and Jacob again. He never stayed on the line long enough for investigators to trace his calls, but Vera prayed that he would eventually be arrested. It's a sin to say, but I hope he is suffering. He took a life that loved life. Although the medical examiner was unable to determine Dorothy's cause of death, due to the circumstances surrounding her disappearance it was presumed to be a homicide. They combed through the area where her body had been found, hoping to find some clue to the identity of her killer, but came up empty. Dorothy's funeral was held on August 22, 1984. Her brother, Jim Scott, spoke at the service, telling mourners that although Dorothy had been killed, her spirit would live on. To me, she exemplified the word give. She'd just give and give and give, no matter what it cost her. She spent her last hours giving and being concerned about others, we've all suffered a great loss. All phone calls from the unidentified caller stopped after Dorothy's funeral was held, and investigators were never able to determine who had made the calls. Detectives never developed any persons of interest or suspects in Dorothy's murder, and the case quickly went cold. They do believe that the person who tormented the family with phone calls was the killer, but his identity may never be known. Dorothy Scott was just 32 years old when she was abducted and killed in May 1980. She had received a number of harassing phone calls in the months leading up to her murder, but police were never able to uncover the identity of the caller. He was most likely from the Anaheim area, but may have moved away after the murder. Krista, who is now 46 years old, still sits on death row awaiting her execution date. However, along with her lawyer, she has continued to fight to have her death sentence commuted to life in prison. So far, she has been unsuccessful, however, that could change. The difference between receiving a death sentence or not comes down to just one year in age. If Krista were 17 years old when she committed murder, the death penalty would have been off the table completely. So does Krista deserve a second chance at life? Or was the crime she committed so heinous that she cannot be helped? Krista Gale Pike was born on March 10, 1976, in West Virginia. Things were done to her by those who were supposed to love and care for her even before she ever left the womb. Her mother would drink while she was pregnant with Krista, and doctors would later say this likely contributed to an underdeveloped brain. She was also born prematurely and given to her grandmother to be raised almost immediately after birth. Her mother chose partying, drinking and drugs over her and her father didn't want to be involved in her life in any way. So, you would think that it's probably a good thing that Krista's grandmother raised her. Unfortunately, her grandmother was just as terrible. She was also an alcoholic and lived with a man she was dating, who was alleged to have molested Krista from a very early age. When her grandmother died in 1988, 12-year-old Krista was sent to live with her mother, who was now working as a nurse and yet still did not have a single motherly bone in her body. Her mother also had a physically violent and abusive boyfriend living with her who would take his anger out on Krista. She would be beaten by him using a belt and again no one stepped in to help her. When she was still a child, Krista's mother decided that she would bond with her the only way she knew how by smoking marijuana together. As you can imagine, this was not your typical mother-daughter relationship. Krista's mother treated her more as a friend. There were no rules in the home. No routines. Krista was basically allowed to do whatever she wanted, whenever she wanted as long as it didn't bother the live-in boyfriend. When the boyfriend became too much, sometimes Krista would stay with her birth father, but that relationship was also very strained. 
he hadn't really been involved in her upbringing and now she was an out-of-control teenager who didn't want to listen to any sort of parenting. As a result, she was kicked out of his home at least twice before she would turn 18. She definitely struggled in school and it's easy to see with such a tumultuous situation in her own life. She dropped out of high school, which gave her even more time to find trouble. Soon she started shoplifting and was arrested even spending time at a detention center for her crime. What will become apparent as we go further into this story is that Krista Pike is not a sneaky criminal. She's not careful, she's not elusive, everything she does makes it seem as if she wants to be caught. But after her time in the detention center was up, it almost seemed as if she was finally going to turn her life around. She enrolled in a career training program called Job Corps. According to their website, Job Corps helps eligible young people ages 16 through 24 complete their high school education, trains them for meaningful careers, and assists them with obtaining employment. At 18 years old, Krista wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps and become a nurse and this program would meet her where she was in life and allow her to do that. It was at Job Corps that Krista would meet her boyfriend, 17-year-old Tatterall Ship, who was studying culinary arts. Together, they were a perfect storm. Much like Krista, Tatterall had a difficult upbringing. His mother raised him by herself but she struggled to make ends meet so they were very poor and lived in a bad neighborhood. Tatterall would run with street gangs, get into criminal activity and drop out of school in grade 9. He was trying to do the same thing as Krista, make one last ditch effort to try and get his life together. Unfortunately, the pair spent most of their time getting into trouble together instead of studying. Krista's best friend was another young woman at Job Corp, named Shadala Peterson. The pair quickly hit it off and apparently had a lot in common with each other, including an interest in Satanism, which they are both rumored to have practiced. Tatterall was also interested in the occult and the three of them, Krista, Shadala and Tatterall, were even overheard frequently talking about participating in a human sacrifice. Unfortunately, no one took them seriously. Until along came 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer, another young lady from Jacksonville, Florida who was also taking classes at Job Corporation. Colleen was studying computer technology and ran in a completely different circle than Krista. The two probably would have never crossed paths, however, a rumor began to circulate that involved Colleen and Tatterell. There was chatter about Colleen pursuing Tatterell and the two of them even hooking up at one point. It's unclear whether there was ever any validity to the rumor, Colleen's friends would say no way, while Tatterell would eventually confess to the pair hooking up behind Krista's back. Either way, Krista was incredibly jealous and possessive of her boyfriend. She wasn't going to let another girl have him, whether the relationship was real or imagined. One day in January of 1995, Krista was at Job Corp and she casually mentioned to one of her classmates that she had decided to kill Colleen because she just felt mean that day. Again, the classmate didn't really take her seriously and thought she was just angry about the rumors involving her boyfriend. But the following day, Krista asked Colleen to hang out with her, Tatterell and her friend Shadala. They planned to head out to the park that evening and smoke pot and Krista had offered to share with her as part of some sort of peace offering. Around 8 p.m. that evening, the four were spotted walking away together from the job court dormitory, however, only three would return a few hours later. Once they were away from prying eyes, the real plan became clear. Krista was going to kill Colleen, as a human sacrifice and out of pure rage and jealousy. Her friend Shadala acted as a lookout to make sure that no one was walking their way or could see what was happening. For the next 30 minutes, Krista viciously tortured Colleen. First, she made her undress, removing both her shirt and her bra to humiliate her. Krista and Tatterall began to kick Colleen as she lay on the ground. Then Krista took out two weapons which she had brought with her, a meat cleaver and a box cutter. She began cutting Colleen with the box cutter, carving a pentagram on her stomach. Then she began stabbing Colleen and slicing at her skin, cutting her more than 300 times while she was still very much alive. Colleen tried to talk to Krista while she was lying on the ground bleeding. She tried to convince her to stop, saying that if they let her go she would go back to Florida immediately and never come back. This didn't stop Krista. Instead, 
she took a large piece of asphalt that was lying on the ground and began hitting Colleen on the head with it until she died a very agonizing death. Krista would later describe the gargling sounds that Colleen was making as she choked and suffocated on her own blood. When Colleen finally stopped making noises and it was clear she had died, Krista bent down and picked up a piece of Colleen's skull, putting it in her jacket pocket to save it as some sort of trophy. Then, the three of them covered her body up with leaves and walked back to the dormitory as if nothing had happened. They left Colleen's body behind in the park in a very shallow grave not even making any attempt to hide it. Krista returned back to her dorm room around 11 p.m. and again, she didn't try to hide anything. Her roommate was there, and she was ready to brag about what she had just done. She told her roommate straight up that she had killed Colleen, and when the roommate didn't believe her, she pulled a piece of skull out of her pocket to prove it. Later on, this roommate would testify in court that Krista appeared to be very proud of what she had done, she was smiling and dancing around as she retold the story. And yet, no one went to the police. And I'll never be able to understand why. It wasn't until two days later when an employee of Job Corp stumbled across the body, at first believing it to be the remains of an animal, but discovering it was a mangled human body upon closer inspection. It was Colleen Slemmer, just left there in plain sight for anyone to find. The cause of death was blunt force trauma, but she had been brutally tortured before she finally succumbed to being hit in the head with the asphalt. Her body was so badly brutalized that the first responding officer couldn't tell if he was looking at her face or not. Her body had too many wounds to count and the medical examiner noted that around each of the wounds was red, which meant that Colleen's heart was still bleeding when they were inflicted. She was alive when she received all of those stab wounds when her throat was cut and the pentagram was sliced into her skin. Krista bragged about the killing to just about anyone who would listen to her, so once Colleen's body was recovered, it didn't take the police long to determine who their main suspect was. When they brought her into the station for questioning, she confessed to the entire thing and gave police permission to search her dorm room, where they would find her jeans soaked with Colleen's blood. She showed investigators where she had dumped evidence, including Colleen's ID, and then she retraced her steps back to the scene of the crime, giving them all the details they would need to build a solid case against her. If there was ever any doubt whether Krista had killed Colleen, it would be squashed when a school counselor discovered a jacket that Krista had left behind in his office. In the pocket of the jacket was that piece of Colleen's skull. Krista would give a lengthy confession about the horror she unleashed on Colleen. She wrote that the two young women had been having issues for some time, mainly over Krista's boyfriend and rumors that Colleen was pursuing him. Initially, Krista said she just wanted to scare her to get her to stop running her mouth and to leave her alone. According to Krista, Colleen pleaded for her life, but this only made her angrier because the more she talked, the more difficult she found it to go through with the killing. She described how at one point she thought she heard someone walking toward them so she stopped the attack to look around. Colleen took this opportunity to try to get up and run away, but Krista pushed her back to the ground and began kicking her in the face. Krista claimed she wanted to put Colleen out of her pain and misery, so she did her a favor by hitting her in the head with a large piece of asphalt. She also sold out her boyfriend and her friend naming Tatterall Ship and Shadala Peterson as her co-conspirators. Krista was charged with murder. While it was absolutely crystal clear that she had tortured and murdered Colleen, her attorneys tried to argue that she had a diminished mental capacity and very severe borderline personality disorder. They pointed toward her difficult upbringing and the abuse she suffered as a child, as well as her dependency on marijuana. What's really interesting is the findings that one expert discovered a doctor named Jonathan Henry Pincus studied Krista Pike's brain and found that her frontal lobes were not put together properly. It is the frontal lobe where a sense of right and wrong is developed and recorded. He testified that he believes Krista was doomed from the beginning when her mother was pregnant with her. She continued to drink heavily which resulted in Krista's brain not forming properly. He continued to say that every killer he has ever examined shares three features, brain damage, a history of abuse and mental illness and Krista had all three of these features. These factors are likely a reason for her committing murder, but they are absolutely not an excuse and the courts agreed because she was found guilty of capital murder and conspiracy to commit murder. It only took the jury two hours to reach their decision. 
But if there was ever any doubt as to whether or not Krista was remorseful over her actions, well let me just clear that up. After trial, she wrote her boyfriend a letter in prison, which said, Please write me. I miss you so much. You see what I get for trying to be nice to the all? I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she died quickly instead of letting her bleed to death and suffer more, and they f fry me. Ain't that some ass? Please write me and tell me what you're feeling, also, tell your lawyer if he wants me to testify for you. I will. Love you for the rest of my life. Lil Devil. As for her boyfriend Tatterall Ship, he would also be convicted of murder for the role that he played and he was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Krista's best friend Shadala Peterson, who acted as the lookout, testified against both Krista and Tatterall and received probation in exchange for her testimony. As for Krista, she would never be leaving prison. She was sentenced to death by electrocution, which is practically unheard of for a young woman to receive such severe sentencing. But we all know how long these things take, so all she was sentenced back in 1996, she still sits on death row today. And she has been keeping very busy in prison. In 2004, she got into a tiff with another inmate named Patricia Jones and she tried to strangle her to death with a shoestring. Again, Krista has absolutely no capacity to try and hide her crimes and she confessed to the entire thing on a recorded phone call with her mother. Allegedly, she was recorded saying, I wrapped that shoestring around her and tried to choke the life out of her. She was passed out on the ground, mama, twitching, foaming at the mouth, her eyeballs was bugged out so far, her eyelids were flipped up. She was charged with first degree attempted murder, not that it really matters, because she's already supposed to be executed. In 2012, I guess she became bored with her life behind bars and she attempted to escape. She made a plan with another inmate and a corrections officer, however, the plan ultimately failed. She was never charged for this attempt. Last year, Colleen's mother, May Martinez, petitioned the court to finally set a date for Krista Pike's execution. She said, I want this to happen before I die. Otherwise, nobody will see justice. It's been a long time coming, with Krista now being 46 years old. Her attorneys want her death sentence to be commuted to life behind bars due to her deteriorating mental health and the brain damage inflicted upon her because of her abusive childhood. As of now, there has been no date set. If she is put to death, she would be the first woman to be executed in Tennessee in roughly 200 years. Lisa Underwood owned a bagel shop in Fort Worth. In the fall of 2003, she began having a personal relationship with Barbie, who had been a customer at the shop. Barbie was married. They stopped seeing each other at the end of 2003, and Underwood subsequently began dating another man. She was still seeing that man when she resumed her relationship with Barbie in July 2004. She then became pregnant. She informed both men about her pregnancy and told Barbie she believed he was the father. Underwood's employee, Holly Pills, planned to host a baby shower for her at the bagel shop on Saturday, February 18, 2005. Pills testified that Underwood, 34, then seven months pregnant, stayed home from work the day before the shower because she had a cold. Underwood later told Pills that she was feeling better and was excited about the baby shower, and she planned to arrive at the bagel shop shortly before 4 p.m. on Saturday. On Saturday at 3 a.m., Denton County Deputy Sheriff David Bronner stopped a man walking along the service road of Interstate Highway 35. It was cold and had been raining. Bronner testified that the man's clothes were very wet and that he was covered in mud. When Bronner asked the man for identification, he said he had left his wallet at his friend's home nearby. He gave Bronner a false name and date of birth and then took off running on foot while Bronner was verifying it. He ran into a thickly wooded area. Bronner and other officers searched for several hours, but lost him. Underwood failed to show up for the baby shower, and the police were contacted. They went to Underwood's house to investigate. There were no signs of forced entry. Neither Underwood nor her seven-year-old son, Jaden, were in the house. There was blood on an entertainment center, 
the walls, and other items in the living room. It appeared to police as if someone had attempted to clean and conceal a blood stain on the living room floor. Underwood's car was gone, and there was blood on the floor in the garage. Jaden's glasses were next to his bed. An inspection of Underwood's home computer showed that she used it for about 40 minutes around midnight. On Tuesday, February 21st, Underwood's Dodge SUV was found in a creek near Interstate 35 in Denton County. The front end of the vehicle was submerged in the water, and the rest of it was sticking out. Some cleaning solution was in it, and Underwood's keys and purse were found nearby. The car was about 300 yards from the location of the encounter Deputy Bronner had with the unidentified man the morning that Underwood disappeared. Bronner subsequently identified Barbie as that man from a photo lineup. Detectives Michelle Carroll, John McCaskill, and Brian Jamison of the Fort Worth Police Department traveled to Tyler to speak with Barbie, then 37. They found him, his wife, Trish Barbie, and a co-worker, Ron Dodd, 33, in a Walmart parking lot. After some initial conversation, they asked them to come to the Tyler Police Department for further questioning. There, Carol and Jameson interviewed Barbie in one room, while McCaskill interviewed Dodd in another room. Barbie stated that he worked cutting down trees on 19 February, asterisk he drove home to Fort Worth that evening and then went to Dodd's house later that night to work on a truck that he and Dodd used as a business vehicle. He left Dodd's house at around 2 o'clock or 3 a.m. When he arrived home, he slept on the couch so as to not wake his wife. Barbie acknowledged that he had dated Underwood and that she had informed him he might be her unborn child's father, but he claimed he had not seen or heard from her in a while. He eventually acknowledged being stopped by law enforcement in Denton County around 3 a.m. that he had given the officer a false name and date of birth and that he ran away. Officer Carroll then excused himself to go observe Officer McCaskill's interview with Dodd. Barbie subsequently opened the door and asked to use the men's room. Carroll testified that he and Barbie then had an unrecorded conversation lasting 45 to 60 minutes. He warned Barbie that Dodd was going to lay this whole thing in Barbie's lap and that Lisa's family needed closure. Barbie told him that he and Dodd devised a plan to murder Underwood because Lisa wanted to use his name on a birth certificate or she was trying to take money from him, she was going to ruin his family, his relationship with his wife, Trish, and he did not want that to happen. Carol testified Barbie told him that he dropped his car off at Dodd's house, and then Dodd drove into Underwood's house and left. Barbie went inside and tried to pick a fight with her. He was unable to provoke a fight, so he called Dodd to pick him up. He later had Dodd drop him off again. This time, he was able to get her upset enough that he could start a fight with her. He wrestled her to the ground and held her face into the carpet until she stopped breathing. Jaden then came into the room, crying. Barbie walked up to him, placed his hand over his mouth and nose, and held it there until he stopped breathing. Afterwards, he tried to clean up the house and cover a blood stain with a piece of furniture. He placed the bodies in Underwood's car and drove to a road off of Farm to Market Road 407. Using a shovel Dodd had given him, he buried both victims in a shallow grave and placed debris on top of it. He then drove Underwood's car to another location and stopped it just short of the creek. Carol had Barbie locate the roads he had used and the site where the bodies were buried on a map. He then took him back into the interview room to make another recorded statement. After Carol finished his second interview with Barbie, he exited the interview room and told Trish Barbie that her husband had confessed to the murders and wanted to speak with her. She wanted to speak with him as well, so she went into the interview room. Carol did not go in with them, but the recording equipment was on. Stephen told Trish that Underwood called and threatened him, so he went to her house to talk to her. He said Underwood was going to ruin him and that they fought. He said he held her down too long and didn't mean for her to stop breathing. Barbie spent that night in the Smith County Jail. The next morning, he rode with Carol and another officer and directed them to the grave. Carol testified that Dodd had already taken them to the same area, but the bodies were not located until Barbie went with them. The medical examiner testified that Lisa Underwood was killed by traumatic asphyxiation, most likely from being held down until she stopped breathing. Additionally, 
she had a broken arm, facial abrasions and contusions, and bruises on both sides of her back. At the time of her death, she was seven months pregnant. Jaden's death was caused by asphyxia by smothering. He had a large bruise above his right temple due to some sort of impact to the head. He had further bruises and abrasions on his back, arm, hip, and leg. He had bruises on his lips and gums that appeared to come from pressure being applied to his mouth. DNA evidence showed that Barbie was not the father of Underwood's unborn child. Teresa Barbie testified that she was married to Stephen Barbie from 1996 to 2003 and that she had physically assaulted her during the course of their relationship. During one of their fights, she suffered a bad concussion. While she was bleeding and unconscious, Stephen sat in another room and ate ice cream. When she awoke, he made her drive herself to the hospital. Teresa also testified that she was dating Ron Dodd at the time Lisa and Jaden Underwood were murdered. She stated that Dodd had been at her house on the night of Friday, February 18th. Dodd and Barbie left in Dodd's truck sometime after 10 p.m. and Dodd returned home alone shortly after. As soon as he returned, Barbie called Dodd, and he left again. He returned with Barbie about 15 minutes later. At around 3 a.m., Barbie called Dodd. She heard Barbie say come and help him and that he ran out of gas. Dodd left and Teresa went to sleep. When Teresa next saw Stephen Barbie on Sunday morning, he cried and said that his life was over with. He later called and said he had confessed to police. He told her he didn't mean to and that he went over to Underwoods to talk to her, but they got into a fight. Teresa asked him, what about the boy? He replied that he didn't mean to and was just trying to keep him quiet. She asked if Dodd was involved. He said Ron's mistake was in picking him up. By the time Teresa visited her ex-husband in jail, he had become more defensive. She testified that Barbie kept changing his story and said he did not commit the murders. On another visit, Barbie held up a piece of paper asking her to say that Dodd was the killer and set him up. She started crying and laughed. Barbie then had Teresa removed from his visitor's list. At trial, Barbie's attorneys claimed his confession was the product of fear and coercion and noted the lack of physical or forensic evidence tying him to the crime. A jury found Barbie guilty of capital murder in February 2006 and sentenced him to death. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed the conviction and sentence in December 2008. Ronald Royce Dodd, who had a previous conviction for harassment by telephone, pleaded guilty to tampering with evidence, a third-degree felony. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was released in March 2016. Since then, he has been arrested twice and has received two convictions for misdemeanor domestic assault. In his appeals, Barbie claimed that his attorney violated his Sixth Amendment right to effective counsel by confessing his guilt during closing arguments without his consent. A federal appeals court declined to overturn his conviction based on that claim in 2018. Barbie was then scheduled for execution in 2019. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals then issued a stay of execution so that it could consider Barbie's Sixth Amendment claim. After considering briefings filed by Barbie's attorneys and the state, the court dismissed the appeal. Another execution date scheduled for Barbie in 2021 was stayed while Texas reworked its protocol for allowing spiritual advisors in the death chamber during a prisoner's execution. The state's long-standing practice of allowing a Christian or Muslim prison chaplain in the chamber was challenged in 2019. As of 2022, after a series of changes in policy and challenges to those policies that reached the U.S. Supreme Court, Texas now allows a personal spiritual advisor selected by the prisoner into the chamber. Barbie challenged his third and final execution date based on further complaints about the Texas Department of Criminal Justice's spiritual advisor policy. Early in November, U.S. District Judge Kenneth Hoyt issued a stay of execution, stating that TDCJ's unwritten policy allows prison officials to unilaterally and capriciously decline to accommodate a condemned prisoner's requests and that Texas could not perform executions until it produced a clear written policy that complied with recent U.S. Supreme Court rulings. Hoyt's ruling was overturned by the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals on the grounds that it was too broad. 
Hoyt then reissued his opinion on Tuesday, November 15, but confined it specifically to Barbie. Hoyt also rejected a claim from Barbie, who used a wheelchair and had limited motion in his joints, that being strapped to the gurney in the standard position, with his arms and legs straightened, would cause him extreme physical pain. Hoyt noted that the warden at the Onsville unit had already stipulated months earlier that Barbie's disability would be accommodated. The state of Texas immediately appealed Hoyt's ruling staying Barbie's execution to the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which overturned it in a four-sentence order issued Wednesday afternoon. The U.S. Supreme Court of Appeals declined to take Barbie's case. Barbie's execution began on schedule at 6 p.m., but the process of inserting four lines took an unusually long time. Prison spokeswoman Amanda Hernandez stated that this had to do with Barbie's inability to straighten his arms. The procedure requires that two lines are inserted, and they are normally placed on the prisoner's hand and inside the elbow. The line went into Barbie's hand without trouble. The second line was ultimately inserted into Barbie's neck at 6.49 p.m. Lisa Underwood's mother and friends watched Barbie's execution from a viewing room adjacent to the death chamber. Some of Barbie's friends watched from another room. His spiritual advisor held his hand and prayed with him before he made his last statement. In his last statement, rather than reflecting on his actions or showing remorse to his victim's loved ones, Barbie gave a short gospel sermon. God knows the truth. He is the truth, the way, and the life, Barbie said. He thanked his minister, friends, and supporters, expressing love to three of them by name. I want everyone to have peace in their heart that only Jesus can give us. I am ready to go home. I am ready, Orden, send me home. He repeated that he wanted everyone to have peace, to spend eternity with Jesus, and that he was ready. The lethal injection was then started. He was pronounced dead at 7.35 p.m. As we conclude this harrowing journey into the world of chilling crimes, we're left with a lingering sense of unease and a renewed vigilance for the safety of ourselves and our communities. These stories remind us that darkness can lurk even in the most unexpected corners, and it's our responsibility to remain vigilant and work towards a safer world. Let these tales serve as a stark reminder that while justice may not always be swift, the light of truth will ultimately pierce through the shadows. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of the macabre, and may we all strive to keep the darkness at bay.